Hello everyone, it's UXW Bill here once again with another Vintage Computer Rescue and Restoration video. What do we have here today? Well, what we have here is a DTK Peer 1630 personal computer. Now, DTK was a longtime producer of various PC clones throughout the 1980s and the 1990s. Much to my surprise, although their website is significantly busticated at the moment, it does appear that DTK Computer is actually still in business to this day, albeit in a potentially reduced capacity and perhaps no longer in the United States computer market. Now this is a machine that I found, oh, probably five or six years ago. It was given to me by the local public library and it had been donated to them as well. However, it was definitely not anything that they could get any use of at the time. And I really think they sat on this machine for probably about two or three years before it was given to me. And so it has been sitting for a long time. It is powered up right now and it is basically functional as you can see. However, it definitely needs some help here and there and we'll be getting into that a little later in the video. This is probably the first time this computer has seen power in close to 10 years. One thing you can tell right away from looking at it, I'm not sure if the camcorder is sensitive enough to pick it up or not, but if we look very carefully at the front panel, and yeah, I don't really know, it's not really showing up in the viewfinder, but maybe you can just make out, especially around the area of the reset and turbo buttons, how this thing has some yellow residue on it. I actually cleaned this case down here on these bottom three louvers and I also cleaned it up around and inside the DTK logo and I gave the three and a half inch floppy drive a little bit of a cleaning as well. This was yet another computer that fell victim to someone who smoked while they used it and what's most amazing when I popped the cover on this because I heard something loose inside and of course I later found it right there it is a lovely little screw I st could still smell the odor of the nicotine and tar even for all the years that this thing has been sitting it still smelled like stale cigarette smoke in there I could not believe that the odor had not dissipated in that time so while I was inside this machine I blew it out with air and I also found that loose screw and I discovered something rather interesting this machine is not exactly stock anymore. Let's have a look inside and see what's going on. Now this computer was most probably manufactured sometime in either the very late 1980s or the early 1990s and by that time the rear mounted power switch that was once so common on PCs, ATs and various clones of those machines was certainly on its way out. However, this machine definitely has an older style design. You can see the full-size AT style power supply here. You can also see some of the telltale orangish colored dust that indicates this computer was inhaling smoke. Over here on the expansion cards you can see some discoloration on those DIP switches that are on the modem. There's the VGA card over there probably that's probably for an import mouse and over here is the serial serial and the parallel port there's a game port and a 25 pin serial port but let's go ahead and pop the cover da, na, na, na. UXW bill computer time da, na, na, na. computer time break it down da, na, 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 You know, you just can't buy entertainment like that fur head. In fact, some people have asked, and no, you can't buy your own fur head. Amazingly, he is housebroken, and most of the time, he doesn't even try to break the house. But what a bunch of comic relief that sure was, and I'll bet none of you were expecting it. Anyway, going onward with the tour of this computer. This is indeed a Microsoft Import Bus Mouse Adapter Card followed by an Oak Technology based VGA board with an interesting feature. Let's see if I can actually turn this around on the desk here. There's not exactly a whole lot of wiggle room here. As you may have noticed when I first showed the back of the machine, there are two ports on the back of this Oak Technology VGA card. The first is the oh-so-common 15-pin three-row analog VGA connector. 
The one further down is a 9-pin connector that exists to connect an older style, typically CGA or EGA style computer monitor. This board might go so far as to emulate a Hercules adapter and allow you to connect such a monitor, but I don't know that for absolutely certain. That used to be a very common feature on video cards, and it was done on some EGA cards as well. The idea being that when jumpers were set appropriately, the card could behave as though it were an earlier graphics adapter and could drive the monitor, drive an older monitor, with lesser capabilities than a VGA one. Now, this wouldn't give you the ability to display VGA graphics on your older monitor because it simply wouldn't be possible. However, some cards did support, so to speak, fake video modes that might fudge the synchronization specs a little bit either way, but hopefully something that was within the capabilities of your older monitor and might allow you to cheat a few extra video modes out of the monitor that it would not have ordinarily been able to manage while being driven by an appropriate graphics card. It is also possible that this adapter could emulate VGA output on the application level while driving an older monitor. However, that is yet another fairly complicated thing to do and not all software would work with it. There's a couple more empty slots here, then there is an internal modem, and finally there is the multi-IO board. Now these days, everything to do with IO is integrated into the motherboard. Back when this computer was made, that approach did exist on some systems, especially portable systems, where there simply wasn't room for a dedicated input-output card like this system has, but it was definitely not such a common approach. Now for a tour of the motherboard. As you may have been able to figure out, especially if you are familiar with this particular model of DTK computer, you'll notice that the board is not original to the system. At some point in this computer's life, probably not far removed from the date written on that sticker, someone replaced the motherboard in this computer. This, uh, this computer was a 386SX class machine clocked at 16 megahertz when it was new. It's still a 386SX class machine, but the processor speed has gone up quite dramatically. And unlike some of these AM386SX 40 MHz processors, you can see that this one does not have a Microsoft Windows logo on it. It still wouldn't have been a crazy fast performer, but it was certainly an improvement over the 16 MHz Intel 386SX based motherboard that was originally in this system. All of those pads next to the microprocessor were probably used by the motherboard maker to facilitate testing of the board or even debugging of the board while it was being designed. This motherboard is rather interestingly based on a Macronix chipset, as you can see. These days, Macronix does not make personal computer chipsets anymore. Rather, they make flashable ROM and I think also RAM chip modules. So there's definitely been some significant upgrading here, and for the most part, it has been done fairly well. However, someone did, I believe, yeah, this is the, uh, this is the key lock connector, and someone, I thought this was the speaker, and someone has done a rather interesting job of adapting it to work with this motherboard. Of course, I don't actually have the keys for this system, so I have no way to know whether or not the key lock function is actually functional. And you can see that someone has borrowed the hard drive. Now, I am not sure when this may have taken place. I think it may have been a condition of my having been given this system when I expressed interest in it to the library staff. However, I don't know. All I know is that I looked through my collection of hard drives hoping to find something in the couple hundred of megabyte range, and I didn't find anything like that. The closest thing I found was this um, one gigabyte or so Seagate hard drive. Says I tested it. Hopefully it's still good. I have a couple of these in a box and I am hoping that maybe I can get this to go in this system, though I will almost certainly need some sort of dynamic disk overlay software. Hopefully I can scare something age appropriate up from the Seagate website. The vents on the power supply were solidly caked in uh, dust and tobacco residue. I blew this thing out with the air compressor before I ever took it in. And then I let it sit down here in the basement and run for a while with the air purifier up there going so as to try and encourage this thing to smell better. I am pleased to report that that experiment seems to have been a success. 
Now it looks like this system shipped originally with a five and a quarter inch 1.2 megabyte floppy drive. I would like to switch these drives around and make the three and a half inch drive A, but I'm not sure if that can be done, although it looks like I'm probably going to get seriously lucky as instead of using a cable with one edge card style connector on it like the five and a quarter inch drive needs and one pin style connector on it, it looks like someone actually installed a proper upgrade kit in this computer and installed a cabling adapter. So I should simply be able, without any jumper reconfigurations or anything like that, to get this computer to handle the floppy drives being in the reverse order because I don't have a lot of software that I would want to install on this machine that happens to be on five and a quarter inch floppy. Of course, it has to be said, this machine was suffering from another problem, as so many similarly aged machines are. That's right, it had an evil soldered nickel cadmium battery on it. When these systems were new, that battery was recharged, but as I've said in some previous computer videos where those batteries have shown up, they have gone completely bad these days. They are totally evil, and they need to be removed from the motherboard by any means possible. Unfortunately, without that battery in place, the system will not maintain its BIOS settings, nor will it maintain the time and date. Fortunately, this motherboard has a four-pin connector to facilitate the attachment of an external battery, and so that is exactly what I'm going to adapt it to do with some hook and loop fasteners, sometimes called Velcro in a world less concerned about trademark recognition, and I'm also going to install a four and a half volt battery holder as there is a diode drop on the motherboard not only to reduce the voltage slightly as the original battery was a 3.6 volt battery but also to prevent the motherboard circuitry from attempting to charge the outboard battery which was typically a lithium type though I suspect any decent alkaline or carbon zinc battery will work fine as well and then here salvaged from another computer is a little bit of hookup wiring that I will join to the battery container. Then I will find a place out of, way, out of the way in this system, hopefully far away from the motherboard in case the batteries would leak, to actually hook all that up and see if the system does in fact maintain its time and date settings. Of course, since there's no hard drive in this system, I will have to install an operating system. So that's really about as far as I can take things right now. But I'll give you a quick tour of the system setup utility and you can see this thing turn on and listen to the sounds that it makes. I'll also point out some interesting memory test behavior that was explored slightly in my 386DX 40 MHz machine video. Alright, I've gone ahead and swapped the floppy drives around here, swapped the cabling as well. Went ahead and hooked up my outboard battery. Now this hookup is just temporary. If this works correctly, then I will actually go ahead and heat shrink and solder those wires. I went ahead and removed a few of the adapter cards as I have no plan to use. I don't even have an in-port mouse and I don't have any immediate plan to use the modem, though I may do something with that in a future video just for fun. Got the hard drive hooked up, not mounted yet because I don't have any screws for it. Rather amazingly, I was able to find my bag of slot blanks so I don't have to leave any of those open at the back, which every hardcore geek knows is just a horrible thing to do. Well, let's go ahead and turn this thing on and see what goes bang. Monitor still starts up, so that's a good sign. Now you hear that slow tick? That's the memory count. Listen to what happens when I hit turbo. See how that works? Alright, now it did remember its settings, though it usually takes a while for the capacitors on the board and such to discharge. So let's go into system setup here. I love that purple colored notice for the uh, video ROM copyright. This is one of those AMI BIOS setup utilities that uh, predates the Win BIOS and that you can actually change this color scheme for. Now I kind of like this basic blue one. But the motherboard maker, whoever made this motherboard, has no identifiable markings on it. In fact, it looks to be just another no-name Taiwanese board, preferred this color setup. 
And of course you can just choose all kinds of different combinations. There's even one for black and white monitors in there, as well as one for reversed video. But like I say, I like the simple basic blue one. Let's go in here and set up our floppy drives appropriately now that I've swapped them around. This thing does indicate that it could support a 2.88 megabyte drive. Of course the I.O. card would have to support that. And as for the hard drive, let's just go ahead and put the parameters in for that. I wrote those down on the back of the battery box here. Let's see, is NumLock on? I can't tell. No, I don't think NumLock's on, so we'll turn it on. 2100 cylinders. 16 heads. Whoops, how'd we get four? I don't know. 16 heads. The landing zone is usually the last cylinder if you don't know it. And 63 sectors per track. It did calculate it correctly, but I don't think it'll actually work because this system would not be new enough to have logical block addressing or extended CHS translation to handle reporting the hard drive's geometry to the underlying operating system. I've got a diskette here. This is actually an IBM PS2 L40 reference disk, so this machine won't be happy with it, but it should boot it. Along the way of cleaning the controls and such, I discovered that the reset button sticks, but the turbo switch works perfectly. So fortunately, and hopefully, I won't have to be resetting this thing a whole heck of a lot. Let's go ahead and reboot and just see what happens here. Four megabytes of installed memory. Drive seek. And it looks like it's going to boot that reference disk, though in a moment I will get a notification saying that it is not. Oops! Bad or missing command interpreter. Well, maybe the floppy drive's not working quite properly. Or maybe it just needs a little limbering up after all these years. Let's just go ahead and try that again, see if maybe I can get it to work. I may have to take it apart and clean it, it's hard to tell. Getting a little further this time. Yep, there we go. IBM Personal System 2 Model L40SX. And if I go ahead and continue, it'll tell me the reference diskette in Drive A will not run on this computer. So that's pretty much everything there is for right now. Definitely expect to see a part two on this computer. Thank you for watching, and feel free to leave a comment if you have one. And of course, as always, I have to do my signature power switch flip. Check this out.